Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 197 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at EV education and what we can do about it. This season of the podcast is sponsored by Zapmap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that I'm already looking at episodes for next season. Any particular topics you want me to cover? Suggestions to info at evmusings.com, please. Our main topic of discussion today is education. I recently encountered a young EV driver who we'll call Sarah. She was at a charge stop trying to use one of the high powered chargers there as I was looking at the Tesla V4 units which are co-located. Sarah was trying to plug her car into the charger in the adjacent parking slot rather than the one attached to her slot. So I went over and asked her if she'd rather try the new Tesla chargers which are cheaper. Now, Sarah lives in Brighton. She has no off-street parking. She drives an e-Corsa. She uses local AC to charge, and she's only recently passed her test as evidenced by the provisional driver sticker on her car. As she charged and we were chatting, I learned several things that concern slash annoy me. Number one, Sarah uses Waze to locate her charges. Now, I've checked it out, and there's some fairly decent functionality in the app, but It doesn't have all the charges on there and it doesn't show all the charges on or near a route. For example, on the route to my mother's, it only shows the units located physically on the road I was taking and not the ones I might use that were located just off a motorway junction, such as uh, Duckmanton on the M1. Although it does show both, surprisingly enough or confusingly enough, both the northbound and southbound motorway service area charges, despite the fact that you would only be traveling in one particular direction. Sarah had no idea that specific EV charger location apps such as ZapMap exist. She's also concerned when using high power chargers in case it puts too much power into the battery and damages it. Uh, She tries not to use really fast chargers as a result. Thirdly, Sarah always charges up to 100% on rapid chargers and wonders why it takes so long to finish. Number four, she had no idea how fast her car was supposed to charge and what's a good charge speed to expect. And fifth, Sarah has no idea which charging networks rate highly amongst drivers and which are the ones to avoid. Now, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this comes down to one thing and one thing only, education. Now, I don't fault nor criticize Sarah for not knowing these things. We all have to learn. But somewhere down the line in the big scheme of things, when she took delivery of her car, Sarah was not given a suitable handover or a link to information sources that help answer those questions. In other words, we, the generic we, failed Sarah. Education is the most vital thing when it comes to electric vehicles. We've talked before on this show about the mindset change. People think that EVs are just ice cars where you put electrons in instead of petrol. And at the basic level, Yes, they are. But as we've also said on the show, nobody's born knowing how to drive or run a petrol car. You either learn by osmosis or by actually getting out there and doing it. Nobody knew exactly how to use a petrol pump the first time they did it. And having worked in petrol stations for several years, I can tell you from experience that many of them still have very little clue. Friend of the podcast, Ashley Bannister from LinkedIn, replied to a post I wrote on this subject and he said, quote, Education is so important, and you're right, it's not the driver's fault. The first stage of learning is subconscious incompetence. In other words, we don't know what we don't know. So it's absolutely up to the supply chain to provide some education, end quote. The key there is subconscious incompetence. We don't know what we don't know. The statements that Sarah was making are seemingly silly in the big scheme of things. Quote, I try not to use high power charges in case they damage the battery. Now, obviously, as EV drivers, we know that this isn't the case, but someone brand new to driving these would have absolutely no idea. If you have no idea, then a statement like that makes absolute sense. 
Now, with nearly 200 podcast episodes covering all aspects of the EV and renewable world, I hope there's an amount of information and education here which a new driver like Sarah might find useful. If I've helped even one new EV driver, I consider that a win. But in the big scheme of things, we need to be looking at educating lots of EV drivers and potential EV drivers. I asked a few select listeners and fellow EV drivers to give me their experiences of how they learned about electric vehicles. Regarding my own EV journey and the education that I've been involved with, I mean, I've listened to uh, various podcasts, obviously EV Musings. Thank you very much, Gary. I have recommended this podcast to many, many people. It's very insightful. And also the e-books that you've written, and this isn't a plug, I am genuinely recommending them. They're very, very good and insightful from somebody who's been and done it. And I think that's the thing that many people forget. We do need to listen to people who have more experience than us, especially if you go on any sort of social media out there, you know, someone will post something about an EV and there'll be a thousand people who have never driven an EV slagging them off. So we have to be very, very mindful that there's a lot of misinformation out there. But regarding education, I mean, I kind of did it all myself. So I went out there and I chucked myself out and I took, I sponged it all in from various sources, especially, like I said, from various podcasts and my ongoing journey. Um, I just asked people like that. It all comes from people who know more than us and taking that information and sponging off them because we all know that car dealers are pretty useless and they're uneducated. And if they're not willing to be educated, they cannot give the information on to somebody else. Why do we all think, you know, 20 years ago when I learned to drive, the highway code said this. 20 years later, the highway code says something completely different. But people are so, I mean, egotistical in the fact that they don't want to be criticized about anything regarding driving a vehicle and they're not willing to educate themselves any further. So I think there lies our main problem. I had a Tesla since 2017 and I'm a fairly technical person. So I actually had been researching uh, for, about electric vehicles for a good couple of years before I took the plunge. I had to find a lot of the information by myself, but there was already, even then, quite a lot of good content out on, say, YouTube. And then I discovered the Electric, both um, podcast and um, website, which had a lot of good news about the EV industry. And so I used that to start following fairly closely what was going on. So I discovered the fully charged channel, which covered an awful lot more than just Teslas. And, um, and really, I think that that's how I learned an awful lot about electric cars. And I had to learn things like what's the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. I had to learn the difference between fast charging, rapid charging. All of this stuff was really covered on these YouTube videos. I was lucky in that Tesla were very good back in those days at giving information to drivers to, to help them understand the Teslas. And what I understand is that as of today, that the, the kind of orientation that I had when I, when I went to pick up my car and I managed to get um, a, probably a good half an hour with somebody from the showroom, a lot of people don't have that same um, education and, and a lot of people, if they're buying other cars from dealers that are not Teslas, uh, I've heard that, uh, there are some dealers, uh, and so of course some are better than others, but I've heard that there are some dealers that really don't seem to be that committed to the electric vehicle transition. Final point, of course, when we all grew up, um, and uh, if some of us are getting on a bit more than others, we were exposed to watching people drive cars you know, right from, you know, from as long as, we, as, as, as early as we can remember. So that hasn't happened with electric vehicles. So even though they're basically the same, they're just cars, the subtle differences are things which we haven't been exposed to all our lives. And so it's no surprise that, you know, we have to make some effort to learn. I first discovered the thing in 2015 when a relative mentioned about his Twizy. I started researching, did a lot of YouTube, which was the first time I engaged with YouTube, discovered Fully Charged. I had a four-day test drive in Nissan Leaf, which I thought was very generous. I had an email conversation with the BMW dealer about the realistic range of an i3. And in the end, I settled on the B-Class from Mercedes. The dealers didn't really understand them and gave out lots of misinformation. 
for example, the salesman had been in this big class for a year and he had a route to work, which was either motorway or back roads. And he obviously the motorway burned through more, more electrons. And he was absolutely convinced the reason why was because there was no ability to regen on the motorway. And I said, no, no, it's speed in the square law and all that. And he was absolutely adamant that I was wrong. In that segment, you heard from Michael French, Tim Rolt-Smith and Mark Garnett. Quite a few different stories there about how people were educated, which means the challenge is quite difficult. For the purposes of this episode, I'm going to split education into different aspects, each of which need different approaches, different resources, and different educators. So let's start. The first level of education is basic education, which a current ice driver will need to make the decision to go electric. What range can I expect with the car? How do I charge it if I don't have home charging? Will the range drop in winter? How much cheaper will it be to run than an ice car? How efficient is the vehicle? How powerful is this vehicle? Now, for some people, this will be the result of going into a car dealership and speaking to a salesman. And this is where the first problem occurs. Discussions I've had with car dealers so far indicate that there are two main issues with dealer education. The first one is that not all dealers get the information they need to know about EVs. In a typical Ford dealership, for example, each salesman will, ha will have a car that they take home every night. But the cars they use aren't chosen by them. They're allocated by the dealership and they tend to be one of the range of cars sold by that franchise. So if Ford at a particular dealership have 10 different models and 20 salesmen, each model will go to two salesmen. The Ford marquee, in the UK at least, will only ever go to two of the 20 salesmen, even though all of them will be expected to sell the car. On top of that, for various financial reasons, a salesman would rather sell a petrol or diesel version that's sitting on the forecourt that they know will sell, rather than an electric version about which they have little knowledge and which might be on back order for several months. For dealers, the commission is earned on the delivery of the vehicle to the customer, not on the order of the vehicle. So if you had a Ford Focus ready to go, or a Ford Marquee with a three-month wait for delivery, which one would you as a dealer prioritise selling? I find this a little disconcerting and I wonder how much of it is deliberate. I mean, if you ask a Vauxhall dealer about the Vauxhall Corsa GS or Design or Ultimate, they can speak chapter and verse about its top speed, acceleration, engine output, fuel efficiency, etc. But if you look at the electric Corsa GS or Design or Ultimate, I'm betting they don't know about top charge speeds, battery chemistry, the power output of the electric motor, or whether the car comes equipped with a 7 kilowatt charge cable and a 3-pin plug cable, or just the 7 kilowatt cable. Why is that? Are the OEMs not providing them with the information they need to answer these questions? Or is the information there, but the dealers aren't bothering to learn it? If not, why not? There's also the FUD aspect in play here, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. A lot of members of the general public will have heard some of the anti-EV misinformation that is being spread by some pretty large media organizations out there. A lot of dealers will probably not have any data to push that back. I mean, how many dealers could respond to a claim that EV batteries are, quote, made from minerals mined by slave children, end quote, without some fairly specialized knowledge about artisanal mining, battery chemistry, and alternate uses of cobalt? So there's definitely an education need around that particular aspect of EV ownership. That's assuming the dealers are interested enough to actually find the data out to counter the misinformation. They're not convinced to sell the cars in the first place. They're hardly going to be convinced to look up anything which can be used against them. If a customer comes in asking about cobalt in batteries, it's easy for a dealer to say, good point, let's have a look at a nice petrol Astra instead. Anecdotally, at least one dealership of a major German-based OEM has had no training slash development work at all on electric vehicles. Makes it difficult to then sell the only segment of their vehicle lineup which is electric, right? The next level of education needed is that for when a new EV driver takes delivery of their first electric vehicle. Uh, this will cover aspects of running one on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you charge? What are the different cables? Why are there different connectors? How do you find charges with apps like ZapMap? Which charge point operators are worth using and which aren't? Why does the charge speed vary and why might it not be what you expect? 
how do you drive efficiently in a vehicle such as this? Now, hopefully a big chunk of education of that sort can come from listening to, he says modestly, this podcast. The issue here is one of delivery, and by that I mean the delivery of the actual vehicle itself. Now, I've mentioned before on this show, but both of the electric vehicles I've had have come on the back of a low loader to my house. The person doing the handover wasn't informed about the details of the car, other than a rather perfunctory, this is how you switch it on, and this is the app you need to download to set it all up. And this is a prime opportunity to do an informed handover and learn about the car. Let's take a little sidebar here. Back in the day, Milton Keynes had an EV experience centre in the main shopping mall. You could go in there, chat with knowledgeable people, and take an electric car away for a weekend or even longer. But when you did this, they didn't just hand over the keys and bunch of bits of paper. The handover process took a good hour and it involved someone going with you to a nearby public charger and physically taking you through a charging session. They were also able to handle and answer all the questions you may have had because they were informed and that was their job. Unfortunately, lack of funding shut down this initiative. But there is something similar in place, albeit not quite the same. The two main grid serve electric forecourts at Braintree and Norwich both have people there whose job it is to educate and inform potential car buyers about EVs. The reason it's not the same is that the EV Experience Centre in Milton Keynes wasn't trying to sell anybody anything. They were simply there to inform. GridServe are providing their expertise as part of their leasing programme, so they have a smaller number of cars and they're primarily focused on helping you make a decision to lease with them. Now, the third aspect of education is knowledge transfer to someone who's fairly technical, someone like myself. I can research, I know what I'm looking for, and I know which questions to ask. But in the big scheme of things, that's not a sustainable model. One of the reasons I was an early adopter to electric cars was because I'm the sort of person who doesn't mind looking into things and doing investigations, etc. I don't mind working in areas of uncertainty where not everything is known about a certain topic. I don't mind change. But not everyone is the same as me. Not everyone is an early adopter. So for people like me, the information I'm looking for is, by definition, going to be different to the information other people are looking at. I'm quite prepared to go look into things like battery chemistries and the C rate for battery charge and discharge, that sort of thing. I don't mind trying to understand charge curves and all the fairly esoteric things you might need to understand to make things like being an early adopter of an electric car work for you. So the type of education I need is completely different as an early adopter to the kind of thing someone in the general public would need. Now, the fourth aspect of education is to my mum. Now, she's been driving for quite a few years, knows petrol cars like the back of her hand, but a bit of a technophobe. Didn't want an iPhone and an iPad because they're too complicated, but ended up getting one anyway. She's constantly calling me and asking me why something doesn't work on her iPad. All I did was I clicked this download link and da da da, you know the sort of thing. She needs enough information that she can use the vehicle without needing daily assistance, but she also needs to make sure she isn't overwhelmed by the huge amount of information that is out there concerning EVs. There's no way, for example, she'd be able to listen through 200 episode uh, back catalog of mine because it would overwhelm her. As an example, she knows I have a heat pump. I've explained that the heat pump is effectively a replacement for my old boiler. What the boiler used to do is now done by the heat pump. But she still asks questions like, the radiators in the normal house work with the heat pump. Does it still send hot water around them? Now, she's going to struggle immensely trying to understand things like AC versus DC charging, charge curves, and things like that, which means she needs to be introduced to them gradually and over a period of time. A book probably isn't going to work for her. For my mum, it needs repetition and consistency. Then... There's a type of education you need to provide to the second-hand market. At the moment, this is the largest segment of EV growth. Recent price drops have resulted in more electric vehicles being bought second-hand. Many of them are coming through dealers, so we have the same issue as we had with new EVs. But a large number of them are coming from websites, such as CarWow or AutoTrader, where a dealer interaction may not necessarily happen. Many are also being bought from auction sites after they come off lease. Again. 
the education aspect is lacking. And I can't finish this episode without mentioning, as I often seem to do whenever it comes to EVs, Tesla. One of the reasons they've managed to corner the market with EVs is that they've made it as simple as possible to charge. The in-car entertainment system will navigate them automatically to a charger. It will tell them how many stalls are free. Once there, all the user has to do is go to the unit, pick up the charger and approach the charge port. It will open automatically, connect and start charging. It will cut off at 80% if the charger is busy. And it's just seamless. That's the sort of thing my mother wants. She doesn't need to worry about different charger types. She doesn't need to worry about payment processing or choosing the correct cable at a charge point. She doesn't need to worry about charge speeds or cutting off at 80% to protect the battery. It's as easy and seamless as her existing petrol car. So before we finish, let's have a look at possible places where you can get good quality EV education. Obviously, there's this podcast, he says modestly. But mine isn't the only one. The Fully Charged Show slash Everything Electric podcast also covers a lot of interesting topics that are both educational and fun. As many people have already discovered, there's YouTube. Content creators like Fully Charged, TheElectrifying.com, Andrew Till, Mr. EV, former guest of the podcast, Tesla Bjorn, and many, many others all do informative videos on different aspects of electric vehicle ownership. Then there's the EV clubs. The, the EV Nexus is a place to start to learn about which clubs are in your area. Pretty much all the counties have some sort of representation in the EV clubs. They meet regularly, usually over the summer, although the Yorkshire EV Club has a lengthened definition of what summer means. And it's a chance for owners to meet and chat about all things EV. It's a great opportunity to listen and learn. Then there's EVA England. This is the organisation acting on behalf of EV drivers and lobbying government for changes. A lot of the recent public charge point regulations 2023 have come as a direct result of the lobbying they're doing. If you become a member, you get a rather snazzy member's handbook, which is one of the best documents I've ever read about owning and running an EV. Ap apologies, apologies. That last sentence should read, if you become a member, you get a rather snazzy member's handbook, which is one of the best documents I've ever written about owning and running an EV because, you know, I wrote it. But all of those resources are things which rely on you as an individual to find them and engage. There's not enough out there coming from dealers, manufacturers, or even the government. Remember the old clunk click every trip public service announcements? Or the Kelsid adverts when British gas was being privatised? Major myself now, right? Or the communication talking about the Brexit referendum? Whether you agree or disagree with it, there was information out there. These are all funded by the government or branches of it. There's a case to say the government should be producing similar things for electric vehicles. Imagine one on charger etiquette, for example. When your car reaches around 80%, it's probably quicker to head off to your next destination rather than wait for it to go right to the top. It'll save you time and open up a charge of someone else who might need it. You know, that sort of thing. The possibilities are endless. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to sort out education in one episode, but I do know that unless and until we have a consistent way of informing the new EV drivers about some of the fairly esoteric aspects of EV driving, we're going to end up with dissatisfied owners, and this will have a knock-on effect for uptake and ultimately the impact on the planet. Also, let's not forget that other countries such as Norway have managed to leap this particular hurdle without a great deal of difficulty. If I recall correctly from a discussion with Tor Haritsoy last season, a lot of this was government funded, especially by making it appealing to go electric. Finally, just to loop back to Sarah, the young girl I met at the Charger, I gave Sarah my podcast details, so it's entirely possible she's listening to this episode. If you are, and I know you're not actually called Sarah, but I needed a name with which to refer to you, I hope you're enjoying your e-Corsa in Brighton. Thanks for inspiring this episode. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. An Ohio company turns retired wind turbine blades into beautiful park benches, planters, and picnic tables for public spaces across the US. With anything up to 9,000 wind turbine blades per year being retired, 
Anything that can be second use for them is to be commended. Canvas, C-A-N-V-U-S, a US startup, brings the blades into the factory in 40-foot sections, cuts them using a rope saw and finishes with epoxy paint. In addition to the edges, Canvas uses recycled materials from other industries such as old tires, shoes and plastic waste. The resulting pieces of, of furniture are beautiful, functional and expensive, which is where their business model comes in. The pieces are paid for by sponsors and sponsors could be anyone from a family that wants to commemorate a loved one to a local business that wants to increase its visibility. Each bench features a QR code that provides more information about that sponsor. With capacity for around 11,000 blades per year, this looks like a great way to promote the circular economy. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at the new email, which is info at evmusings.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link's in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Picks Apple Pay too. I have a couple of books out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent. And it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So you've got renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words, another brick in the wall. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Nothing else. It's okay, I'll wait for that one for you. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know I often wonder if his life would have been radically different if he decided to become a stamp collector. Looking for a penny black or a penny red at flatly exhibitions. He told me he really wasn't into things like that because it's so easy to make a bad deal when it comes to buying the perfect stamp. The dealers didn't really understand them and gave out lots of misinformation. Thanks for listening. Bye!